the reality is that stress is everywhere. No one is immune. And we think about the effect of the brain and also parts of the body. Stress basically affects virtually every organ system that there is. So does like sleep, by the way. Almost virtually every organ system is affected by that in some way, shape, or form. But in order to understand what we're going to be talking about, I wanted to do a quick thing about stress and talk about stress theory, because I think it's important to acknowledge at least the work that's come before us, because this has been studied for a long time. Going back, some of the earliest studies go back to even the early 1900s on how the body responds when it comes to a stressful situation. Is that your staff member there working? <laughs> that might be my medical assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Again, remember, stress is real or perceived. You don't have to be pulling out your hair to be doing that. You can just be busy, all of a sudden your boss dumps another chart on you, or things to do. All of a sudden, you, you, may, you may say, all right, well, I got this, sir, or ma'am, I got this. But internally, your body's going. You might notice that you start sweating a bit more. You might notice you, know, you get a little nervous sensation in your stomach. You might notice that your heart rate goes a little bit faster. You might feel like you might start twitching you know, uh, your finger, twitching your finger, or tapping your foot a little bit, or you might feel like something's brewing up in you. That's stress. We've all been there, and it's real. But remember the body, when we're talking about your brain, we're talking about your brain, four, you know, 40 bytes for us, but 40 million. Remember, you have your conscious brain. We're all sitting here right now talking about things, but realize that there's so many processes in your body going on right now that you have no conscious control of. We only have our conscious brain, but our unconscious aspects can have a big impact on our consciousness. So I'm going to give acknowledgement to a couple of the pioneers with stress management and stress theory. Uh, Dr. Hans Saley, Saley, Hungarian born researcher. And this is kind of small, but basically what happens, what happens to us when we see stress? There's an acute response. And then our acute response is say, all right, alarm, we mobilize resources. And then a lot of us, we try to respond in that kind of stress way. So that's alarm, mobilizing resources, is stage one. When we get to stage two, and your stress resistance starts getting tested a bit. But you try to fight through it, and that's called resistance. You're coping. And so what we're seeing on the slide here uh, is this curve right here. For a certain amount of time, your body's able to resist. And I'm not saying that stress is a bad thing, because I think stress involves a lot of creativity. You know, if you get some, some people are met with a stressor, they can respond very favorably. Um, but we're talking about unrelenting and unabated stress that can really lead to some serious challenges. So what happens at some point, your body mobilizes resources, deal with the stressor, but then remember that your resources in your body are finite. They're not infinite. So as the stressor keeps going, over time we get to phase three, exhaustion. Reserves are depleted. And what happens at that last phase? That's when a lot of breakdown happens throughout the entire body. You start forgetting things. So would that be the same with metabolic stress? Any kind of stress. Any kind of stress. I mean, you know, it's metabolic stress in the body, we've got it down. But any kind of stress that I've been so, your relationships get tested. Maybe with your family or somebody, your friends, coworkers. Uh, your blood pressure starts going up. You start having bad digestion. Your neck tenses up. Your back tenses up. You're <coughs> feeling tight. You can't sleep. You're tossing and turning. And the body's going through and saying, I'm trying to rescue you but I can't rescue you forever. So then we go down. And so they mapped this out in 1936. And I thought it was interesting because I know people were stressed in 1936. And there's no difference that we're stressed right now. But even looking at this, you know, 80 plus years later, it's still relevant because we've all been there, how we respond to a stress. And then at some point we're depleted because we're not taking time to deal with it, acknowledge that. We may acknowledge it, but how do we deal with it? When we did that mindfulness minute, that was designed to help kind of cleanse and purify, and know that, yes, we all have things that we're going to do later on tonight and tomorrow, but can we at least take one thing that's positive and apply that? Because it might be a big domino effect in the right direction moving forward. So wait, Doc, so go back. So would this be similar to, like, the fight or flight response? <coughs> Absolutely. So why don't you explain? All right, so fight or flight response is when, uh, remember that from our old school, um, middle school or junior high health class? Anybody? In those days, you learn about fight or flight. And then we also learned the opposite. It's called rest and digest. That fight or flight spot response. If a grizzly bear comes in this room, I guarantee we're all going to that back door by where Cindy's at right now. Some of us might try to break down this window. We might be able to do that. We have enough force in us. But your body sees a, sees a threat, and you respond. You know, the pupils may dilate. The heart rate may go up. And all of a sudden, your muscles tense up, and then, then, and then you're going to be able to respond. The opposite, where we want to have our bodies in most of the time, is this rest and digest phase where you're able to heal and recover. 
And that's been known for a long time. When we heal and recover, we're so much more productive. We feel so much better. Our energy is better. When we're not in that state, then we are certainly wrought with problems. So how, how much of a day would you say most people are in that fight or flight response? Well, I'll tell you, for me personally, I'm probably in it 100% of the day. <laughs> Except for that mindfulness moment that I have. I do something every morning. I do something called starfish. And some people are probably like, what, what are you talking about? So I starfish in the morning. So what that is, and I learned this from a therapist that's in our practice. And so every morning, as I get on the, I get on the floor, because I can't do it in the bed, because I don't want to run into my wife or anything like that. But I lie on the floor, and I just open up like that. And I say a few things to myself to set the tone and say, you know what? I'm here. I'm human. I'm going to do the best I can. Whatever comes at me, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to be resilient and hopefully fight through. But I think you have to put yourself out to be vulnerable at times to then look downstream and know that you're going to succeed. And so that's what we call starfish. So you can do it in the morning, open up, whether it's in your bed on the floor like me, take a few moments to breathe, and then when you're ready to integrate yourself back into your day, you're really going to set the tone. Or even better yet, when you're driving to work, car karaoke. When was the last time somebody sang to the highest of the lungs in their car? You know? Or maybe when was the last time somebody actually drove their car without listening to anything at all? And maybe, yes, maybe you might hear your your mufflers dragging on the ground, but you never noticed that beforehand because you were listening to music, you were so stressed. But that would have clarity. So I'm going to go to the York Stodson Law that was described in 1908, uh, two positions discovered a relationship. So of uh, stress, uh, between arousal, aka stress, not the other kind of arousal, and performance. So when, at the end of the day, when it starts, to, it's a parabolic curve. So essentially, a person could be either having low stress and not able to perform at all because they're not stressed enough to perform. Or on the flip side, as we go up over the McDonald's arch, as I kind of call it, uh, we get to high points where you're super high stressed out, you're completely burnt out. Optimally, somebody's in this early part of the phase where actually you're still able to be productive. When you're productive, you know you're in that flow, right? We like to say that you're in the zone. It won't be able to be in the zone all the time. And the last thing that was done in the 1960s is another position uh, recognized this concept of flow where we have our particular skills that we want to harness and a challenge, that we rise in the middle, and we have this flow, you're in the zone, and when you're there, you're fully absorbed, you're fully immersed, and you're productive. And that's your brain working at its maximal capacity. And it's like, you, you, you get it. Everybody, anybody ever seen the movie The Matrix? And the time when Neo realizes that he's the one? And all of a sudden, everything changes? We, we've all been there at that time where we had that moment of, clarity and function and productivity, but we just don't get there enough. On the flip side, you can have anxiety or boredom that come in as well, too. You want an optimal channel of flow, and that was described in the 1960s. So the part of the brain, as we talked about earlier, we talked about the main part of the brain, your prefrontal cortex, think about the front of your head, that executive functioning. When you're stressed, are you thinking, clear? are you thinking clearly? No. Are you a little more testy? Absolutely. Uh, do you feel like you're learning things or being present in that moment? Because you can be present without being present. Now, think about that for a second. You can be present without being present. I'll give you an example. We just had Thanksgiving. Who else is running around their kitchen trying to do a million things while still trying to engage with your family members? You're present, but you're not necessarily present. And present is when you're present, you're able to see so many more things clearly. I mean, I love having those deep conversations with my in-laws, and yes, they are raging Packers fans. And, uh, and uh, my, my wife's going to watch this video, she's going to be like, what? Uh, they are raging Packers fans, but it's okay. I can still wear my Chicago Bears gear and be present and have a dialogue. Unfortunately, our Bears have not beaten the Packers, and God knows the win, so I'm going to lose the conversation every time. And actually, speaking of the Bears, real quickly, I'm so glad that everybody's here tonight because you're going to learn, you're learning way more than what the Bears are doing. Because you can't apply anything that the Bears are going to do today to your daily life. It's absolutely true. All right. So we're talking about a couple parts of the brain. Your hippocampus uh, mod modulates basically what we call the limbic system, and I'll certainly your learning and memory. But these issues, self-awareness, perception, how to function, all these parts of the brain, basically what I'm trying to say is that when we're stressed, these parts are not working. We want to make sure that we're able to get, get these parts of the brain working at all times. 